Welcome back. Now, this year's Six Nations Championship had the fairy tale ending for Brian O'Driscoll that many predicted. You will, of course, remember that O'Driscoll announced himself to the rugby world with a hat trick of tries in a win over France in Paris during the 2006 Nations Championship. O'Driscoll didn't cross the white chalk last weekend, but Ireland beat France to lift the Six Nations title. And uh, David, I'll go straight to you because uh, <laughs> you, you, you do have egg on your face. Yeah, if, we remember, <laughs> if you remember, you did say that, that the French would uh, reign on uh, Odrisco's parade, which didn't see the light of day. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll eat humble pie and say, you know what? Yes, well done to the Irish. Yeah. I think they, they are a steely side. Yeah. And again, the, their pack did the job. They scored three tries. They were dominant in that game. The French tried to come back at the end, but... It was, I think, too far gone. Mm. Um, they scored a try. I think it was a forward, a forward pass. pass yeah, yeah. So mm. nothing in that. I think the Irish are deserved winners of the, of the Six Nations. Mm. Uh, it was a competitive Six Nations. So to the end, you, did, you couldn't, really couldn't call it. And I think that's what you want from a tournament. And, and, and Philip will go straight to England because yeah. uh, Sir Clive Woodward uh, did not have <coughs> kind words for, for the English. Uh, they, they ended up <laughs> as bridesmaid once yeah. again. Of course, you get his frustrations as a World Cup winning coach. I think he won it with England. Yeah, yes. totally. yeah, yeah. And and he says, "Look, you finished second three years in a row, yeah. and Six Nations is not going to get any easier. It's getting stronger each year." Mm -hmm. That's his concern. And and when you look at his major complaint with coaching, yeah. he's talking about the substitutions, especially against France yeah. and in Rome, and and France. So it's France. They switched off the last. Five they minutes. switched off the last fifteen. 15 minutes, I yeah. think. Yeah. And in Rome, he has, he has his concerns on the substitutions. He says, look, we wanted 51 points going into that game. Yeah. You're doing well. Your players have rhythm. Then you bring in substitutions. Yeah. But you know when the coach was defending himself, he says, look, one of the substitutions is Manu. Yeah, he scored a try. try. He made tackles. Yeah. Uh, didn't make any defensive errors. Yeah. Turned over a ball at the breakdown that resulted in another try. Yeah. So I think with England, it was... Uh, Clive was being, in a way, emotional, <laughs> but overall, overall, <laughs> he praised the team. If you look at his rankings, mm. players like Owen Farrell, Danny Kea. Mike Brown, oh, for me, was the player of uh, yeah. the tournament. He's, yeah, he he talks back. about them very open, and he says the one thing England has got right now over the past six weeks is they've made huge strides in their forwards and their attacking game. Mm. And he says going into the World Cup, this is good for them. So he critiques them, but at the same time says they've made a positive step. Mm. So I think his major concern is the frustration of being second three years in a row. Mm. And like they say, Six Nations is getting stronger mm. every other day. But, but there are so many positives <coughs> that England can hold on to. Definitely. That halfback uh, combination of Danny Kay and uh, Owen Farrell yes. was a beauty to behold, wasn't it? Yeah, Danny Kay has been around. Mm. Uh, then he went and, you know, threw himself in the mud. Yeah. <laughs> but he's recovered quite yeah. well. Yeah. Uh, Young's injured. So they do have two good halfbacks. Yeah. Owen Farrell has grown as a confident player. He won World Player of the Year, I think, sometime. Yeah. Or, and I don't know how, but <laughs> at least this year he's, he's, he's quite improved. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think for me, the guys they've blooded are uh, the captain, yeah. Rob Shaw. Yeah. I think yeah. he's come out really Chris strong. Rob Shaw. Yeah, yeah, Chris Robshaw. They have the two locks. Yeah. And then they've unearthed that center, Luther Burrell. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Who brings in a new element that to Ilangi, I think we'll be wondering whether he'll play the World Cup or yeah. not. Yeah. Yeah. John was okay to come up shortly, but first let us get through some of your Twitter responses that, as always, you've been sending using uh, the rock and roll hashtag. And here I have someone called uh, Ugandan Raga who writes, and I quote, schools rugby is actually nice, though I wonder why the players call it quits after high school. And of course, this is a theme that... that uh, the back rower, Stephen Ogwete, also explored in his dispatch to us. Mm. Uh, and uh, in his dispatch, uh, Ogwete urges us to talk about the young talent that is coming up and how we can keep them, quote, un unquote, ticking. Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's been a huge concern for everyone. Yeah. Uh, university rugby has not taken off as well. Mm -hmm. So depending on where you go to university, I think that's the first point people are lost. Uh, you'd think that come through high school, go to a university, play university yeah. league, natural growth, yeah. uh, probably keep the same patterns. So that has not worked out as well. I think it's been something that an experience, the experiment that Kasasa must be pulling his hair out for, yeah. Yeah. Um, not the best. So 
talking to the president, Andrew War, I think he's mentioned, uh, he called it a junior tournament? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the under-20 league. Uh, yes, a junior yeah. tournament, yeah. an under-20 league, and really rallying teams around that so that they hopefully structure them around the existing clubs. But if that's not possible, either we just allow the teams to gravitate along around something and just put the tournament out there and players can play into that and then graduate into the senior team. Um, and it's a concern that expresses, you know what, every year 1,200 players mm, yeah. come out of schools. Yeah. Only 100 make, make it, it to the clubs. So you're losing 90% of your players. It's, it's a huge concern for the, for the, for the, for the union for the and union. for the, actually the game as a whole, not the union, as just the game. I think as anyone watching rugby, if that many players are being lost mm. and hope, well, if they're turning into fans, fine, but <laughs> I'm sure they just walk away completely yeah, disgusted. Yeah. So that's, 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 that's a, uh, it's a valid point. Okay. Well, our final interview today is with former rugby cranes back rower, John Buma Musoke, who is enjoying a very successful spell as the go-to man for Easy Money Rhinos. They finished fourth in the top flight league, and as he's told us, Musoke still believes he has a lot to offer to Ugandan rugby. Rugby story in Uganda started in 1996, unbelievably. When I tell that to most guys, they don't believe it. Uh, coming in, playing from Kitante Hill School, I started playing for Rhinos, and that's how it basically started. And that year, I made the under-19 uh, national team, which traveled to, to Kenya. Well, I guess uh, initially, Rhinos, everyone will tell you, was a team of uh, uh, guys in the bar with a rugby issue. But uh, over the years, uh, we stuck it in because some of us had to try, get the team succeed, uh, try improve the team. So we felt abandoning Rhinos would more or less lead to the team collapsing. So we stuck it in there with, uh, with a few other stalwarts. Uh, there's a Paul Musoke, no relation. Uh, okay, my elder brother, Henry Musoke. We have people like uh, Paul Olok, who was there. Paul Nyangaviaki, uh, former union secretary. All those stuck it in with Rhinos all through the years uh, and they've been involved in the team as well up to now. Uh, our targets last year and this year was to try and make the players athletic first and foremost. And because what we did was we set a three-year plan. Uh, first year was say let's get the players athletic and competitive and then now moving into this next season that's going to start is we're looking at now saying can we get them improve their skills and actually now play top flight rugby. So that's our focus. I think it's, um, the one thing about it is, uh, I always tell the young players is, I wish uh, I knew what I know now when I was much younger. And one simple aspect is about taking care of your body, uh, as well as saying, moving rugby from just becoming uh, a sport you play on the weekend and saying, let me take care of my body on a day-to-day -day basis. Let me make sure I'm fit, whether I'm playing rugby or not. And once you're able to do that, you know, you, you set your own day for running even though there's no rugby or the gym, you find that when it comes to the game, it gets easier to play. Uh, the, the issue of uh, returning to the national team, that's more or less rumours, I should say. Well, as you said, everyone feels I played a good season. But I think my focus right now is, is, is building on the young talent we have. We have so many young, brilliant players who just need to be given the right direction. Uh, in Rhino, I coach and I play. Uh, I've worked with the Sevens team, which you know I've, I've done before. So my role right now is as much as I can keep on playing, but it's more to pass on knowledge to the young players so they can become better players. That, that's where I see myself, whether it's with Rhinos for the coming years or if I do get an opportunity from the union to, to coach a side, uh, I, you know, I'll take it with open arms and, and see what value I can add to the upcoming players. He certainly sounds confident there and uh, he looks the part, oh he has looked the part on the pitch. Uh, the, the, the key question is, uh, what has he done to reinvent himself? Because uh, previously many people had written him off. This season he came back mm. uh, with all guns blazing. I think the number one thing he's done is he takes care of his body. He keeps fit. 
Yeah. He's on the road more often than taxis. So <laughs> 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 I, I think that's one of the things that uh, many you have to give him uh, deals for. Yeah. He does have the discipline of staying fit. Yeah. Um, in terms of just staying power, the other thing he's done is as he's slowed down and he's bulked up, yeah. he's moved from center fly half position yeah. Yeah. and played in the park. Yeah. Uh, in the loose forwards. And what he brings there is, of course, a rugby brain. Yeah. Um, and then his kicking ability. Yeah. He has a very good boot. boot yeah. uh, he has vision, having played fly half. Mm -hmm. So when he comes into the park, it's almost a fresh, a breath of fresh air. And I think yeah. that's why we chose him as, as, as the number eight, eight of the eight. season. Mm -hmm. yeah. Something, of course, you disagreed with. But <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not really me, it but, but, but uh, <laughs> and, uh, it's not really hard. Sorry, should I say it's not really easy for someone to play you know, that eight-man role, is it? Um, no, but as I said, he has a very good rugby brain. So, first of all, from the scrum, which is the number one platform for mm -hmm. setting up play. Yeah. How do you pick up the ball? How do you combine with nine and ten yeah. to tie in these eight and make sure play continues? Yeah. Then from a defensive perspective, to say, I am a sweeper of sorts, which is what he does well. So, if we lose the ball as we are attacking, yeah. where is my eight? Normally, the number nine and the ten will do that. Yeah. But a good eight is also able to provide you that cover yeah. mm. and position himself for a counter attack yeah. which is what he did i think really well and his kicking for territory yeah. i think is something that you never see with many eights yeah you never and uh, his club brain was uh, they, they have over the years you know guaranteed themselves uh, a crack at top flight rugby mm. the, the model that they have used could you just uh, break it down for us uh, I, I, i'll use one word here there's something we're discussing uh, to do with love rugby and, and this is part of the examples we are talking of. You look at a man like John Musoke. I am sure the best of the best of clubs in Uganda approached John in his prime. Because yeah. Rhinos was really a small club. And you'll be amazed. He featured for Rhinos when he was in Titante Hill School. Yeah, indeed. By the time he came to play in real club now, Rhinos, there were clubs fighting for him out there, the biggest of clubs. But John had his heart there. And it's this thing, it's, it's this heart that is building rhinos around what it is. Yeah. You look at his brother, James Mositra, yeah. at fullback last season. Yeah. I'm sure there are clubs that have thought of approaching James, but they say, look, they love these boys show for their club. We can't. And it goes all through to the other players. Bulotti, the scrum half. Yeah. All these are guys who have played for rhinos when rhinos has had nothing. Mm. Forget now that they got sponsorship from Easy Money Rhinos. Yeah. From, sorry, Easy Money, to make them Easy Money Rhinos. Yeah. So for them, it's been purely hurt. And this is what has built the foundation of that club over the years. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's it from us today. Don't forget you can keep in touch with us uh, on Twitter. That is through our hashtag Rock and Roll. From the three of us and indeed the crew, it's goodbye. <laughs>